Well, thank you all so much for coming, and, and thank you to the Congressional Internet Caucus for hosting. Um, this is obviously a very interesting case to dissect, um, and I know that we have a good mix of lawyers and non-lawyers in this room, uh, so we're going to try to break this case down in, in the limited amount of time that we have and hopefully leave about 15 minutes or so at the end for questions. Um, so first and foremost, a bit of background on the holding of this case. Um, Justice Roberts uh, wrote the majority opinion for this case, and the holding was in two parts. Uh, the first part was that the government's acquisition of the defendant Carpenter's cell site location information, CSLI, which is kind of a messy acronym, uh, was a search under the Fourth Amendment. What is important under this finding is that it did not extend what is known as the third party doctrine, which is embodied by cases uh, starting with U.S. v. Miller and Smith v. Maryland. The third party doctrine essentially means that you have a diminished expectation of privacy when you give your information to a third party. Um, the second part of the holding is that because this was a search under the Fourth Amendment, a warrant based on probable cause was required to obtain this type of data. Uh, so for the majority, we had Justices Roberts, Kagan, Sotomayor, Ginsburg, and Breyer. And for the dissent, we have all writing separate dissents, uh, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and uh, Kennedy, which we will be talking about uh, the implications of towards the end. Uh, so what I want to do is start off by actually forgetting that the Carpenter opinion happened and have each of you tell me what the status quo was like before this case was decided. Um, so first, I guess I would like to start with um, Dan and, and Evie and ask, pre-Carpenter, what was required to obtain cell site location information? If you want to start, since you actually did it. Uh, certainly. Um, hello, I'm Evie Easton, um, just across the river in Arlington. We generally, when we wanted to get anything resembling cell site location in Virginia, um, the uh, Electronic Communications Privacy Act, the Stored Communications Act at the time, allowed us to get historical information, information that in the past through the use of a court order with, a, with judicial approval. And we would uh, prepare an order based on an affidavit um, prepared by the police officer, and then we would approach a judge of our circuit court and ask the court to enter the order, which we would then promptly send to the cellular phone provider. Some years ago, um, a case came through the Fourth Circuit um, that seemed to suggest that we might need something more than uh, a court order for cell site information. So uh, probably about six or seven years ago, maybe longer than that, in Arlington at least, we started uh, preparing court orders based on probable cause and getting judicial approval uh, for that, uh, for cellular site uh, information. So we did things a little bit different in t anticipation of what is now the law uh, through Carpenter. But uh, if we wanted cell site information at the time, we could have gotten it through what's called under the federal law 2703D order under the Stored Communications Act and gotten the information that way. Police officers were very familiar with going down to our magistrate, because in Virginia we have a magistrate system as well as a circuit court system, and they could have gotten a search warrant for the same information, either from a magistrate or from one of our circuit court judges. Uh, now they only do that exclusively through the circuit court. Uh, and if we could really quickly get a perspective of what this pre-Carpenter world was like from a privacy and civil liberties standpoint, as well as from a big tech standpoint from David, that would be great too. Sure. Um, you know, we were in a world where the third party doctrine was really um, happening any sort of development here in the legal world of what privacy would look like in the modern day. And over the last 15 years, we'd had occasional wins, um, more recently on um, cell phones, cell phone tracking and the information in the cell phone. But underlying it was this idea that sharing information with someone you were contracting with to actually offer you a service and process your information um, actually destroyed any privacy in it. And it was not workable for 2018, probably wasn't workable 20 years ago. And um, what we saw was because there was so little movement on a federal level, states started to act. So I think there's now 12 states that had some sort of warrant protection for location data in the U.S. Most of that was through state legislatures, although there might have been a couple 
that were through the state constitutions. Um, and it followed on a number of efforts to tackle this issue by issue. And it's interesting to see that that will continue now that we have more of a legal theory going forward that we're not going to be taking on the third party doctrine altogether probably over the long term, but we're gonna to have to look at unique types of data collection and technology and the threats that they each pose. David, pre-Carpenter World. Yeah, I think there's always been some ambiguity about how courts would look at the third party doctrine and uh, the Smith and Miller cases, which were decided in, in the 70s, how, how they would be applied to sort of to, to, uh, in light of technological innovation. And I think what we've seen over time, at least, um, is courts sort of make uh, traditional distinctions between content and non-content. And, 2010, the Sixth Circuit decided a case, uh, United States versus Warshak, uh, where they uh, effectively opined uh, that to the extent the Stored Communications Act does not require a warrant for content, that the statute is unconstitutional. Um, and so there's been a little bit of incremental chipping away at this third party doctrine, but there's been a lot of uh, questions about the extent to which the third party doctrine maintains its vibrancy in light of technological innovation and in circumstances where transactional data was uh, was being uh, transmitted to third-party service providers or stored on third-party platforms. And so in, in a pre-Carpenter state, there were some questions about the extent to which the Fourth Amendment would uh, extend to that type of transactional data. And that's that's certainly a question the Fourth, I'm sorry, the Carpenter Court uh, answered in, in one particular set of circumstances. Great. So now we're in a post-Carpenter world, and I'd like to talk about what it means for each of your perspectives. So, so I'll start on that. Um, I think from a uh, state prosecutor's perspective, it's a mixed bag. I mean, it was a loss. Uh, we started uh, the day before Carpenter was issued. The law in most of the country was that we didn't need a search warrant to be able to obtain uh, cell site information. Now we do if it's over a week or a week or over. Uh, so what that does, and Evie can sort of confirm this for me, is it's going to make it harder to do some criminal investigations. Uh, there are some investigations where you don't have probable cause yet, but you have a suspect, and the cell site information will help you uh, really pinpoint whether that suspect really is, is your guy because you get that information that they were using their phone around the place of the robberies. There are crimes, Justice Kennedy listed them in his opinion, serial killers, arsonists, certain you know, robbery sprees, uh, certain drug crimes where they take place, uh, in multiple sites, and this information really is helpful to the investigation. So it is a loss to the government that uh, they can no longer uh, obtain uh, this information without a probable cause-based warrant. Now, there's not necessarily a huge number of cases affected. Um, someone had, someone from Queens County, New York, a very large county, said that out of 54,000 prosecutions in 2016, 92 of them uh, used cell site information. Um, and of course, how significant a loss would be depends on what other technologies are affected, and we're going to talk about that a little later. But it could have been a much more damaging loss. So um, the court took pains to say it was not getting rid of the third party doctrine, uh, and so not taking away the government's ability to uh, subpoena banking records, credit card records, uh, other financial records. That's really the bread and butter of government investigations into finance, you know, tax evasion, uh, bank fraud, a lot of drug crimes, and the like. Uh, the court said it wasn't calling into question uh, what it called conventional surveillance techniques and tools, such as security cameras. Of course, there will be litigation about what counts as a conventional surveillance technique and tool. We'll see. Uh, and of course, uh, the court left open the possibility that the government could still get cell site information for l under a week. There will be litigation about that, but if the government could get it for, say, six days, it's possible that that will fill in part of, uh, mitigate some of the damage uh, to the government and its ability to investigate some crimes. And Michelle, what does this mean for privacy and civil liberties? Well, I just can't be more excited about uh, what this means for us and so happy that we're here under good news and not bad news, right? Um, I think uh, a ruling that would have just across the board held up the third party doctrine would have been devastating to our work. Um, but as far as the litigation is concerned, it does give us a roadmap of how to be successful in the future and challenge different types of technology. Um, <clears throat> I think it's interesting that it was actually the government for many years, especially after 9-11, who advanced the mosaic theory. 
Of course, this was on the idea that they didn't need a warrant, but what they told Congress and others is why they needed so much information is that when you put it all together, all these disparate dots that don't seem to mean anything by themselves come together and provide a meaningful picture of something, right? And the court embraced that. And this is, I think, really just um, a monumental thing for us. Um, I guess we'll talk more about sort of what we hope is next, but I think it also helps us reconceptualize uh, what is maybe most important to a certain type of people who are making these decisions, right? Um, it was interesting that we often talk about privacy as collection on information on innocent people, and we're most concerned about maybe broad requests on people who don't have individualized suspicion, and the court here was really interested in um, long-term tracking of sensitive data on a single person. And so we will have to be thinking about how that affects our uh, legal positioning. But um, I think it also, for our field, uh, rejuvenates our work in the legislative space um, with not just the federal, but locals and states where we've had more luck in the privacy area. Um, it is definitely something that strengthened our hands, right? It was always considered a political issue, something to take on law enforcement or intelligence, um, to have something like a, a Roberts, right? This opinion is going to give some validity to this argument that I don't think we all had ourselves just as an advocacy community. Now, Evie, I think Dan sort of previewed this answer, but I would love to hear procedurally and in practice, what is this going to mean for law enforcement, particularly with regards to other types of information that they may now try to obtain instead? Well, if I could, let me just say that, um, and I was uh, talking with my colleague here, um, you know, cell site information is interesting, and most people hear about cell site information as incriminating information um, in a criminal case, that it's used by the prosecutor to prove that somebody was in a general area or an area of a place at the time that a crime was committed. But the same argument can be made that if cell site location information is in the hands of the defense and prove that the, de the defendant was in a different state at the time of the commission of the crime, then that's exculpatory information. Now, I will point out, and it's a small point, but I will point out that by requiring now a search warrant for the, um, to get uh, cell site location information in a particular case by the prosecution in most cases, that it's going to be an impossible uh, procedure for the defense to get their hands on this unless the prosecution or the police department does it for them. Um, and I will also point out that by the time that comes to fruition, we may be looking at, depending on the state that you're in, um, anywhere from 30 days to a year down the road, and depending on the retention periods of that information by the cellular provider, that data may or may not be there when the defense requests it. Even if the government and the law enforcement folks say, okay, we'll go get it for you, it may not exist because there is no national standard for the retention of data by these cellular providers, and so it is a little bit of a hit or miss situation. So when law enforcement seeks to get the information, for obvious reason, they, they try and get it right away. But now we have to stop, take a deep breath, and say, listen, you know, in most cases, do we have probable cause? Do we have enough now to get a search warrant? And by that time we get there, um, is that data still there? Is it still useful? And if not, it's gone forever. Um, and so I just want to point out that small point that it can be both incriminating and exculpatory. A second practical point with the requirement now that we get a search warrant is that we are so used to hearing about federal government search warrants. You know, somebody in the Eastern District of Virginia, the U.S. Attorney, can go get a, a search warrant, and he has the ability to send it nationwide. Well, if you're not in a state operating under Virginia law or in a state that has a long-arm statute, if you're in a state in this country where your state law does not authorize the local prosecutor or law enforcement to get a search warrant uh, that is then served on a provider in another state, what is a local prosecutor supposed to do? Back before Virginia passed our own long-arm statute that gave us that authority, I remember one time when I had to get a search warrant for this kind of information 
from a cellular provider in New Jersey. And so we prepared the search warrant. It was signed off on by a judge, um, but we couldn't serve it in Virginia. So we just forwarded it up to New Jersey and asked them if they could please, the prosecutors in New Jersey, please go to their judge and see if he would enter a New Jersey search warrant to ask the provider for the same information. And the judge in New Jersey said, not doing it. I'm not the cellular provider judge. I am not going to do it. Hmm. So Virginia was left twiddling their thumbs with no apparent ability to get information from a cellular provider. That's the kind of issues that confront states and localities when they're trying to get this information through lawful process. Um, I'd also point out, too, that interpreting this decision um, I have three trial judges. Arlington, for most of you are locals, I suspect. Arlington is a community of about a quarter of a million people. We have three trial judges that would rule on this issue. Looking ahead, I think maybe I would get three different opinions hmm. uh, about what Carpenter means. And if you multiply that by the number of trial judges across the country, I suspect you'll get thousands of different interpretations of what Carpenter means. So what do we do with that? We're going to have litigation for years to come. Nobody's going to have a real answer on whether or not five days of cellular uh, cell site information is, is something you can get without a warrant or not until the Supreme Court again weighs in on this. So the uncertainty of that makes this very difficult from a local prosecutor's standpoint. Mm. Um, and finally, I just want to point out the irony um, of the third party doctrine in Carpenter in the sense that I've done financial crimes for decades and I think I get actually more information from financial records than I do from cell site location information. <laughs> Credit cards tell me where you've traveled, what you've bought, um, when you've done it, where you've been for the most part. Um, there's a whole lot of detailed intimate information in credit card and banking information that Carpenter now says is fine to get with a subpoena under the third party doctrine. So I find the distinction a little bit between the privacy interests in your physical location and your privacy interests in your credit card records and the details that we get from that kind of information to be troubling. I believe Justice Kennedy made a similar point in his dissent. Um, David, I want to direct this next question at you. Um, I noticed that Google joined an amicus brief with Apple and other big tech companies um, that said that they weren't taking one side or another in this case, but nevertheless spelling out uh, a vision, so to speak, of what the Fourth Amendment should look like in the digital age. So I was wondering if you could talk about that vision and also explain why do cases like this matter to big tech companies? Yeah, so I, I think when we filed uh, the brief with a num number of other technology companies, we filed it in large part because we, we believe that the third-party doctrine should not categorically foreclose Fourth Amendment protection uh, for data that's automatically generated by the use of a device or for uh, data that's generated by activity devices and services that uh, have yet to be uh, discovered and or uh, invented. Um, and I think, you know, the court agreed uh, that there are limitations to the application of the third party doctrine in the context of certain types of transactional data, in this case, the collection of cell site location information over a period of of four months, and what the court concluded here was that this type of data is qualitatively different, that it is a different uh, species uh, of business records, as they said, uh, and that I think it's becoming increasingly clear that the third-party doctrine is ill-suited to address the types of uh, data uh, that is collected uh, and used in modern-day life. I think the court was uh, made a observation that venturing into this public sphere merely by the use of a, a cell phone, which is collecting uh, location information merely by its use, uh, doesn't ex extinguish the Fourth Amendment 
rights that an individual has in, 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 in the data that's being collected. Um, I, I, I agree that some of the distinctions here are unsatisfying ones. I think that's a function of the fact that the third party doctrine uh, originated under, under cases where we couldn't envision where uh, technology was headed. Um, and so the court, rather than disturbing the third party doctrine, overturning it or, or jettisoning, and jettisoning it, uh, was trying to render a decision that uh, created some, some consistency and some predictability. Uh, but it's hard to envision a scenario other than saying that the, the third party doctrine rigidly applies here, where you wouldn't have at least some outstanding questions about where, where the courts are headed with these sorts of, uh, with these sorts of cases and, and, and the particular facts and circumstances that may, may shape future uh, decisions. From a, from a practical perspective, I'll just say, you know, we're, we're, um, we collect location information. It's different than cell site location information. It's more precise. We've always required a warrant for that type of information. From a practical perspective, I'm not sure that a lot is necessarily going to change, um, at, at least in that, in, in that vein. Um, if you look at our last transparency report from, I think, the second half of 2017, we had 16,054 requests. We break that down further into you know, warrants, subpoenas, and what we call other court orders. Um, that will encompass the type of 2703D orders that were at the subject of uh, that were the subject of the Carpenter litigation. I think we got 1,334 of those requests. I think it's natural after a decision like Carpenter that we're going to be reassessing our, our protocols in, in light of uh, what the court said. Um, but there are outstanding questions here. There, you know, as, as Justice Roberts noted in his majority opinion, um, this is a narrow decision. It, it, you know, it, it was rendered in the context of collection of cell site location information over a four-month period. Uh, so there are outstanding questions, I think, about the episodic collection of uh, location information, other types of information that uh, may have some bearing on, on, on some of the Fourth Amendment issues that we're discussing. Yeah, that's a perfect segue into what I wanted to talk about next, and that was the fact that Justice Roberts literally had a laundry list at the end of his opinion about what this opinion is not supposed to do. He specifically said this opinion is not meant to discuss real-time collection of location information. Uh, it left tower dumps alone, um, expressly did not overrule uh, Smith or Miller. Um, did not apply to conventional surveillance techniques such as surveillance cameras or conventional techniques involving foreign affairs or national security. Um, and of course, as uh, both Dan and Evie have pointed out, there's a question as to length of time of surveillance of location data. Um, so my next question to all of you is, was this case really a big deal? Well, I won't deny that it's, that it's in a very important case, and it continues a series of decisions by the Roberts Court that recognizes and affirms that the Fourth Amendment is going to be analyzed differently when we're looking at new technology. Um, but uh, it's certainly conceivable that when the court ultimately reaches those uh, issues it didn't reach, the uh, real-time tracking, cell tower dumps, uh, um, metadata, um, that it's possible they will um, in the end rule for the government there, and you might, we might look back uh, 10 years from now and say it wasn't that big a deal. It certainly, I think, has the potential to, um, uh, to really uh, affect uh, the government's ability to use this new technology. So, um, so let me give one thought on how I think we're going to go about assessing these future cases, and then uh, if you think it would be useful to maybe give some thoughts on how the, what I think the court might do. Um, so it's hard, as I think David uh, was suggesting, it's hard to predict what the court's going to do in these future cases based on the nature of this opinion itself. There was no bright line drawn. Uh, it was, and I don't mean this to be critical, but I think the nature of the Chief Justice's opinion was it, it was judging like a common law court, using uh, sort of their, the, the court's, the justices' sensibilities and intuitions about how far was too far in terms of our privacy. And I suppose if the test is what's a reasonable expectation of privacy, well, what we're asking is nine justices to give their sense of what members of society would think and what we think is reasonable for a member of society to think uh, in this new high-tech age. Uh, there aren't bright lines on that. Um, we could draw analogies. We can just give our sense and his sense to the five justices. His sense was that, boy, getting 127 days dating back uh, years and we're getting, you know, 
They said we're, we should really take into account what the technology is today where you really can find out where the person was in a pretty tight area. That's too much for us. The dissent had a different view, and whether they will view um, metadata the same way, whether they will view a cell tower dump, which is different on a couple of axes, right? It's a shorter period of time. You basically, as I understand it, and you all probably know the technology better than me, they take a couple of cell towers, they say, Let's, we're gonna look at all the calls that were made there for a short window of time, and then see if we could find numbers that were at both sites, which might help them link who might have committed, a, you know, who might have been the robber who committed both robberies. Um, so it's a shorter period of time, but it's getting information, so information from uh, non-suspects. Maybe they'll view that differently, maybe not, and I don't think you could read a definitive answer from, uh, from the Carpenter decision. Uh, so not to go on too long, let me just talk a moment about um, real-time tracking, which I gather is through devices like Stingrays that allow the uh, a law enforcement officer to basically mimic a cell tower and intercept calls. So you go to, I guess, a location you're targeting, and then you'll be able to determine who's making a call from there. I, my sense, as someone who follows the court closely, is that the facts of the case, as it will ultimately reach the court, would matter a great deal. Uh, is was the, was the law enforcement officer using that to find out who is, what the phone number was on a call that was from a house? In which case, I think they might be deeply troubled, thinking back to their Kylo decision, uh, where they said you can't, the police can't use thermal imaging detectors in homes. Or were they using the device to find a phone number that came from a public place? Uh, how long was the tracking? Was it for a few hours? Was it for a few days? These facts matter a great deal, and I think we saw that in Carpenter. Uh, the ACLU was very smart in the case they took to the Supreme Court. It was a case that involved 127 days of where this person was. Uh, what if the case that made it to the, Supreme, to the court involved three days of tracking or three hours of tracking, the hours that were around three different crimes? Uh, there's a pretty good chance the government would have won and would be here with a, with a very different tone. would be saying, all right, well, the government won this narrow one, but they left open the case where it's longer. Um, so the facts, uh, sometimes people think that facts don't matter in the Supreme Court and that they're just deciding these very academic legal issues, but uh, the nature of the case that makes it to them matters a great deal, and I suspect that will matter when the case takes up the next series of uh, issues involving uh, high tech. Michelle, I want to turn to you because another focus that Justice Roberts has was on the voluntariness issue and, and how voluntary is it really when your phone is constantly pinging the cell towers around you without you actually doing anything at all. What could that mean going forward when courts try to interpret this case? Um, I, th I think that was one of my favorite parts of the decision because I felt like it pushed us 40 years you know, forward from where the last decisions were about what voluntariness means and understanding that technology is not um, a luxury anymore, right? It's not something voluntary that these things we use now in our schools, at work, um, to get around, to communicate, to buy things, and that you can't expect people to basically live in a cave to, you know, exercise their privacy rights in the modern day. And so I felt like the voluntariness and reconceptualizing it that way, instead of just saying, well, you choose to use this knowing the consequences, um, really put this into a different light. And um, I think and I think that's why it's still a big deal, like your last question. I mean, um, I think there'll be uncertainty, but if you talk to impact litigators, they will tell you that all the rights that we have now actually took decades of litigation to secure, right? And it feels like a very long time now, but this is actually just a small moment in how technology has evolved and will continue to evolve. And so we'll just have to figure out where the rest of that goes. I mean, the other option too is if prosecutors value their certainty more than the residual benefits of, let's say, six days or less, or prospective tracking, they can make the affirmative decision now to get warrants as opposed to using lesser orders in some of these areas where the court did not weigh in. Well, I want to keep talking about the fact that Justice Roberts really focused on the sensitivity of the location information itself, because doing that really left open a lot of gaps and ambiguities for my firm surveillance law practice to just figure out. So was he right about the sensitivity of location data from your perspective, Evie? Well, I'm sort of, I'm looking around this room and I think I'm on the older side, but um, 
To put it into perspective, when I started in 1990, I didn't have a cell phone, I didn't have a laptop, I didn't have any of the bells and whistles. If I wanted to call a friend, I'd use my landline. If I wanted to communicate with them otherwise, I would write an actual letter. Um, and technology has grown so quickly. But we're at this place, we're at this intersection right now where privacy interests are sort of, we're weighing them like this because what does everybody do? Everybody uses their technology for everything. Absolutely everything. And we willingly allow advertisers to, tar well, <laughs> advertisers target us. We do, we do uh, get uh, store cards. Our credit card folks know where we are. Our travel apps know where we are. Google Maps knows where we are. Everybody knows where we are all the time. We post on social media sites, oh, I'm at this restaurant. Look at what I'm eating. It's awesome. We post, we're post happy. We share more information today than I've ever seen. So people are more willing to divulge more intimate and detailed information about themselves than ever before. And I, I put that out there simply to say, should that fact not inform our privacy weighing? You know, how much do we willingly put out there and share, and then can we really complain about being overly sensitive about our physical location when I'm happy for you and you to have it, but not to the police officer over there. I just point that out because it's, it's an irony uh, that that is the case. Uh, David, do you have a response to that? Do you feel like Google's users feel like they're voluntarily sharing all this information with the world? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would make a distinction between information that you are voluntarily divulging. Um, take example, uh, for example, you know, Twitter, which is a very public platform that you are putting out there for the world to digest, uh, versus information that's being automatically collected uh, by a cell phone, in this case, cell site location information. And then there are variations and gradations in between. Um, the a user's, uh, citizen's reasonable expectation of privacy may differ depending on how public that information uh, is and the extent to which it's being sort of voluntarily conveyed. Um, I also am a little bit fearful about the way that the decision was crafted in that Again, if, if if we were if we were thinking about uh, you know we were thinking about a, a Fourth Amendment doctrine for the Internet age, we wouldn't start with the proposition that we should be thinking. I think uh, about whether information is um, uh, provided to a third party service provider. Full stop. Whether it's voluntarily conveyed to that third party service provider, and then whether there's an assumption of risk as a result. I don't think anybody thinks of their privacy that way in 2018. Um, but based on the court's decision, it seems that in some ways, transparency, awareness, even privacy settings have some bearing on a citizen's Fourth Amendment protections. Um, so that, that is a little bit of a concern. Uh, the good news is that there are a lot, a lot of these issues are actually ripe for, for policy uh, consideration and policy debate. That's why it's great to see so many of you out here today. Um, the courts are going to be grappling with these issues, um, but the extent to which some of the more meaningful discussions around the practical implications of the court's decision, the extent to which the Supreme Court reaches those, those issues, they may reach a couple, they may reach a few over the next decade. Uh, in the meantime, there's you know, a lot that Congress can do uh, to address whether the statu statutory protections under the Stored Communications Act ought to be modified in light of what we know uh, about these technologies and the reasonable expectation of privacy, not from a constitutional perspective, the reasonable expectation of privacy that users, I think, believe they have when they're providing this data uh, to a Google. Um, in the same way that when you are storing data on, a on your own device that isn't transmitted to a third party service, your expectation is that data is private. Um, the notion that there should be uh, strong distinctions between how either the Constitution treats that data or how Congress does, or, or our, our laws, whether at the federal or state level, uh, isn't entirely clear, at least to me. So. Michelle, I believe you had something to say too. Yeah, and I, I think this is the 
the importance of making this a constitutional ruling is that, you know, your rights are not use it or lose it, right? They're yours. You get to use them or not. You can even exercise them in incredibly stupid ways, but that's why it's a right and not a privilege, right? And so just because you choose to share some information with people and not with others under certain contexts, um, that's your decision to make, right? It shouldn't change your relationship with your government. And that's what this is about. This is not about how you use Google. This is about what the government has to do to collect information on you when they want to put you in jail, okay? And those are very different stakes. Um, I mean, we've been critical, too, of how the companies collect this information. But we can't say that just because you choose to share information about your sandwich that the government can now track you for months at a time and know everywhere you go, right? Those two just do not connect. Um, and that was the beauty of this decision. I think they recognized that just because you choose to use technology doesn't mean that you opt into government surveillance. Well, I definitely want to leave room for questioning, but because there were four dissents in this case, I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about it, at least some of them. Uh, preparing for this panel about five days ago, I really wanted to talk about Gorsuch's opinion, and I still do, um, because Justice Gorsuch clearly indicated he is not at all a fan of the third party doctrine. Uh, yet he appears to want to revert back to more traditional uh, Fourth Amendment uh, jurisprudence in the form of property-based rights, for example. Um, now, of course, we have to talk about what Justice Kennedy's departure will mean for future Fourth Amendment cases. Um, so I don't know who wants to take this question first, but... <laughs> uh, well, I could, I could start off with it. Um, so Fourth Amendment, like many other criminal procedure areas, the Fourth Amendment was an area where the court was not dividing cleanly among the conservatives and the liberals. Putting to the side the exclusionary rule when it came to issues of was there a search um, and other related issues of you know was the amendment violated. Um, when Justice Scalia was on the court, the pattern tended to be uh, you would have the um, three of the liberals on the court, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan, and Justice Scalia would generally be on the side of the defendant saying there's not a search. On the other side, you'd have Roberts, uh, Alito, and Kennedy, uh, along with Justice Breyer. And Justice Thomas was a swing vote. Uh, it's one of the rare areas of the court where Justice Thomas was a swing vote. Um, now, Justice Gorsuch replaced Justice Scalia. He seems to be similar to Justice Scalia in terms of taking something of an, uh, an originalist view on the Fourth Amendment and I think an instinct to be supportive of the defendant, though, as we'll talk about, it's not clear exactly where his property-based theory is going, but it seems to be even more defendant-friendly than Justice Thomas's property-based theory of the Fourth Amendment. So, um, so the replacement of Justice Kennedy is very interesting because, you know, there's obviously a political hurricane going on now. There, everyone's talking about abortion, gay rights, uh, uh, executive power. Uh, it's actually going to be fascinating to see where this nominee is going to be on the Fourth Amendment and if there's, you know, enough of a, a track record to tell. Because really, as we've see, seen on the court, there are two types of conservative justices when it comes to the Fourth Amendment. There is, and I know just Chief Justice Roberts was in the majority here, so this case was an exception to the general approach I had laid out. And, uh, uh, but generally, Alito, uh, Kennedy, and Roberts had been sort of the law and order side, and you had um, Scalia and Thomas had been more of the originalist side, more willing to be for the defendant. So is the new nominee gonna be more like Alito and say Kennedy, or more like Scalia, Gorsuch, Thomas? Uh, uh, it will make quite a difference in a lot of these cases. Um, certainly, um, the defense has found a friend in Chief Justice Roberts in the Riley case on cell phones in this case. Um, don't be so confident uh, you're going to get him in all the other cases down the line. He is generally uh, a friend of law enforcement on constitutional cases. So um, I think this would be a very important uh, and uh, and pick, and we really don't know who the new person, um, you know, we, can, we can't pigeonhole uh, that a, a Republican nominee to the court is going to be one way or the other on the Fourth Amendment. Anyone else want to venture a guess? I don't want to venture a venture guess, but I, I, you know, I do think this was a really interesting dissenting opinion. In part because uh, if you if you if you didn't know it was a dissenting opinion, you, you might have read it as a concurring opinion, and and it was really but for the theory that was advanced by Carpenter that um, Gorsuch came out on the dis dissenting side. I mean, he said that in the closing part of his dissent that 
um, that that property rights theory hadn't been advanced um, and even was only advanced, I think, in a cursory way in the brief uh, to, to the Supreme Court. I, I, I'm not a litigator, but you know, if, I, if I'm a defendant in a future piece of litigation, I'm making sure that I'm making both of those arguments just to be prepared in the event that this works its way, works its way up to the Supreme Court. Um, it seems to me that defendants are going to be raising both the reasonable expectation of privacy argument and a property-based theory in whatever records a, a third-party service provider might be holding. Uh, well, because we're here on the Hill, I would love to talk about what, if anything, Congress should be doing next. Um, we had a preview of some suggestions from David earlier, but um, Evie, I would like to hear from you and then uh, you too, Michelle, perhaps, um, about how can Congress respond to this case in a way that would help law enforcement or in a way that would clarify things from a privacy and civil liberty standpoint. Well, I, I certainly think it's about time that the Stored Communications Act is finally updated. Um, it's it's been, I don't know how many years um, since it was passed. It's outdated. The definitions are poor. Um, and I really think from a prosecutor's standpoint, I want clear definitions. I want clear guidance. I want to know what I can do and what I can't do. And then, so Congress needs to step in. I need to know what data is protected. What data third party providers need to retain? How they collect that information, how long they retain that information, and how it's preserved. Um, we need longer retention periods uh, for this data that mm -hmm. is accessible via search warrants, uh, if you will, but we need to have the ability to access the data on a consistent, in a consistent manner. So I, would ask and beg for Congress to step into this arena and produce some legislation that is uniform, that applies across the country, that states then can take and model with their own state statutes that locals and state folks uh, can follow faithfully. That's what I ask for. Um, and I, I would say, to me, the next obvious step is around the prospective location tracking, especially if you want to stay in this sphere. So I think if you wanted to regulate not just SCA, but um, also the prospective tracking, you um, could better handle similar issues at the same time. I think forward-looking, though, of what other things that are likely to be challenged but also need your attention because they are sensitive are things like facial recognition. I think that was um, one of the first things to be taken on because it will be um, a voluntariness issue, right? Um, the majority of opinion talked about, you know, you, you don't lose your rights just as you step outside of your front door and talk about facial recognition, that's what happens, right? The minute you step outside, you're now available to the world with your biometrics. and. Um, I don't think we know yet just how much law enforcement is able to collect or where it's going, you know, what it's going to look like in a couple years here, but it, I think, is one of those areas that is going to be um, targeted early on. Um, and I think, you know, this is also um, a chance to think about things like internet records um, themselves, because I think this is sort of a niche, or if you want to triangulate sort of like the importance of the phone itself and everything in it, um, voluntariliness, uh, you know, longitude. I mean, next thing is what's on that laptop, right? And what comes off of it? And in many ways, they're just as sensitive as our cell phones. So I think those are some areas that Congress could look into. I agree with Michelle um, wholeheartedly that if they take up stored communications and redefine terms, they also have to take up the wiretap law and the pen register trap and trace law because they all carry similar definitions across and technology has changed so much uh, that technology that fit into one niche under the Stored Communications Act may now be obtainable under pen register or you might need a wiretap for it. So everything has changed the way these particular laws are applied and so it's, it's, it's pretty urgent that they need to be updated. 
just want to add, uh, you know, th- there's also lower hanging fruit here too. The the court and even the uh, the majority and the, and the opinion and even uh, Justice Kennedy in dissent sort of glossed over um, the the case that I was uh, alluding to before, which they referenced the Warshak case uh, and the fact that your email content is sort of the modern day papers and effects, um, and we've seen. Congress uh, addressed this issue uh, repeatedly now, 2016 and 2017, and now in the National Defense Authorization Act. That's the Email Privacy Act, uh, the piece of legislation that would codify a warrant for standard um, and that would get rid of the current 180-day rule where where an uh, email communication that is over 180 days uh, old can technically be subpoenaed. I think what the court was clearly suggesting both here and in its previous decision in Riley is that uh, to subpoena emails would be unconstitutional. Um, But that rule, that unconstitutional rule, is effectively still on the books. Um, But there are also broader policy reasons, I think, for a company like Google to, to have a rule that requires the government to obtain a warrant for communications content, uh, regardless of who the individual is. The Fourth Amendment applies to U.S. persons. It does not extend to those that are outside of this country. Congress did actually have a revision to the Stored Communications Act earlier this year with the Cloud Act. Um, they talked about uh, obtaining content uh, when seeking data about non-U.S. Persons and they built a warrant scheme around uh, that that idea, uh, but they kept in place the you know the existing 180 day rule. Um, there's a theoretical possibility that that data about non-U.S. persons can be subpoenaed uh, under the Stored Communications Act. We should have, for the purpose uh, of of uh, uh, administrative uh, feasibility and management. Uh, a uniform rule uh, that codifies a bright line warrant for content standards. So I would encourage those of you who are working on this issue and have in the past to continue to push forward this. Uh, It is in the National Defense Authorization Act um, that will ultimately need to be reconciled uh, reconcile with the Senate's version. But there's still an opportunity in this session to realistically uh, update ECPA. Well, we have some time left. I want to open up the floor for questions. Um, So if you have a question, just feel free to stand up, try to speak loudly so that our microphones can pick it up, and and I'll call on whoever I see first. Greg. My, my quick answer is I don't know. But let me give one, I think, important legal gloss to that issue, which is the court held in a case called Davis against the United States a few years back that the exclusionary rule doesn't apply if evidence was obtained in reliance on what the officer reasonably thought was existing law. Say circuit precedent said this type of search was okay. The court hasn't definitively held whether but I think there's a pretty good chance five conservatives would agree that the exclusionary rule shouldn't apply if the law is unsettled, but the officer reasonably relies on a reasonable interpretation of the law. So let's say um, an officer is deciding whether to obtain without a search warrant three days of cell site tracking. Um, I think there's a pretty fair chance that if it made it to the Supreme, and it, that if ultimately that was held to be unconstitutional because it's a search and you needed um, a warrant, that until that is definitively determined by the circuit or the Supreme Court, that the exclusionary rule wouldn't apply because the officer acted in good faith and acted reasonably and not um, uh, in dereliction of his or her duty. Now, that said, I think Evie, who works on the ground, will say, I'm not sure I really want my, you know, my police officers in my jurisdiction doing that because it's too risky, so I'll no, they're going to get a search warrant. Yeah. <laughs> um, regardless, uh, it, there may be from time to time a case where we are not entirely sure that we have probable cause. We have we're just there, and we don't know if if we'll get we'll get there. In that case, we may do a day or two uh, with a, a a court order and see. 
but I got to tell you that it, I haven't done a court order for cell site location in probably two years uh, because our officers go straight to the search warrant. So a court order is, it, you can get it with reasonable articulable facts, which is a lesser standard than probable cause. And uh, when, when ECPA and the Stored Communications Act was first passed, that lesser standard applied to transactional information that you could get with what federal law called a 2703D order. Most prosecutors interpreted that law to mean that we could request cell site, historical cell site location information under that lesser standard, if you will. And so we would prepare in our office a court order uh, with an affidavit that the police officer uh, produced. We'd hand it to one of our trial judges, and they would agree that we had reasonable, articulable facts, sign the order, and it would go off to the cellular provider. They can get that same information with a search warrant. And um, for a number of years, that's exactly how they have pr been proceeding. Um, so in Arlington, from a practical standpoint, unless a case um, is just not quite there and the only thing that we can get to either f confirm the commission of a crime by a particular person or dispel that belief, we're gonna, get for, we're gonna go for a search warrant. Otherwise, we might risk a D order, as they say, but um, I would be really reluctant to go down that path. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, my name is Maurice, my question is directed to the report of Michelle Patrick. Have you mentioned previously that there might be a scenario where a defendant might have access to So I mean I, I can say just from Google's perspective that that so the the the, the data that was um, you, you know at the heart of the Carpenter case was data that I don't believe was readily available to ordinary users. The type of location information that we collect is available, um, and so it's something that users could access. They could produce on their own. I imagine there are also scenarios too in a situation where you have a defendant who uh, doesn't want that data produced, uh, maybe because it's. Uh, inculpatory, um, they are, right, they're not going to be cooperative with law enforcement. In situations where that data is exculpatory, they will consent. Um, it will obviate the need to obtain a court order or search warrant. I think the question just is whether, is that, whether that data is readily accessible, how easily it can be produced, and what the legal avenues are. But I think you know, it, it, will, it will depend on the data, the provider that's holding it, and the extent to which um, really the privacy settings enable a user to access that data. Yeah, and I think almost every privacy law in the books has a consent exception. So the, um, I don't know if you want to call them the data subject, um, can't <clears throat> agree to have the information accessible. So I don't know if the issue is that they can't compel it is the problem, and maybe some companies would not allow that. But um, yeah, and I'm, I think this is also, you know, just something that is going to be changing right now with GDPR discussions in this country about rights that people have vis-a-vis -vis the companies themselves and hopefully it will be evolving into an area where people do have more access. Yes. Hi, uh, Max Billion. You mentioned earlier that this rule won't really change much about how Google is. I was wondering if you could just Yeah, and I, and I was answering that question in the context of just location information that, that we do collect because we do require a warrant for the production of, of location information. I think for other types of requests that we might receive in the future, I think we're going to have to look at we're going to have to look at you know historically the types of requests that we've received, the the types of data uh, that we've been asked to produce, for example, under 2703D. Um, the fact that I think we didn't talk a lot about this, but that the court really did draw a, a pretty big distinct, distinction between what's required when uh, they seek a 2703D order versus what's required when they uh, you know, obtain a search warrant under ECBA. So I think 
right, we're a week out from the Carpenter case. It's really difficult to sort of discern how our compliance protocols might be modified as a result of the decision. Um, but I also think, too, at least from an, you know, ex from experience, we, we found, I think, as Evie was alluding to, too, uh, law enforcement officials are increasingly cautionary and they obtain search warrants to the extent that there is ambiguity. So we haven't run into, you know, these types of problems, I, I think, as often maybe as others have. Yes. Well, the GDPR is, you know, your rights against the company, whereas this is your rights against the government. And I know in the U.S., we've always kept that very, very distinct, right? So I don't know if it necessary, necessarily follows. I think there's already interest in the U.S. on rights vis-a-vis -vis the companies. But um, I think as you see more of these cases where it comes into people's consciousness, um, facts are gathered, right? I think this was maybe one of the first cases because we know so much more about cell phones than we do about some of these other technologies, right? That I think they, they do contribute to each other, but, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. I believe that's all the time we have, but um, thank you all very much for coming, and, and please do uh, continue to check out this ongoing series of SCOTUS Tech, and, and uh, I'm sure they'll have some great events coming up in the future. Thank you very much.